Anthropomorphism. It's a word most of us have heard at some point, be it on a Thursday evening episode of Pointless or in a deep discussion with a philosopher about the state of modern religion. The word itself comes from the ancient Greek anthropos, meaning human being, hence anthropology, study of people, and morphos, meaning form. You know, like we say things morph into other things, shapeshifters morph into different people, same root. If your immediate reaction to that was, but what does it actually mean, Erin? And what does that have to do with the ancient world that you're really supposed to be talking about? You're in luck, because I'm about to tell you. As you can probably gauge from its etymology, anthropomorphism is when something, namely a divine being, is represented by human characteristics. In the ancient world, this was pretty common. The gods of ancient Greece and Rome all portrayed as totally ripped blokes at the peak of human fitness and attractiveness. The goddesses, perfectly proportioned and proud owners of childbearing hips, usually hidden behind thin fabrics that were just modest enough. Portrayed through the male gaze, of course. If they'd have been mortal, the pretty privilege would have been insane. That's basically what I'm saying. This artistic choice may have been to make it easier to show which god was which, given the human attributes they were given to individualise them. These humanised representations were seen as a sign of respect and a way to honour these deities the ancient people worshipped, a few very different to that of Christianity. When Emperor Constantine of Rome declared tolerance for Christianity in 313 BCE, it marked the beginning of a very different representational path. Christians believed that their single God should not be represented in human form as he is transcendent beyond anything the human mind could possibly imagine. Even though he was described as walking with Adam in the Garden of Eden and other such humane instances in the Old Testament, he was mainly seen as a sort of spiritual concept. Something that definitely separates the Christian God from the Greek gods is their method for procreation. Mary was obviously impregnated through the power of the Holy Spirit, making it totally immaculate and meaning God couldn't possibly have human lusts and urges, especially not something as shameful as sex outside marriage. The Greek gods, however were, how, how to put it, promiscuous. Zeus alone is known to have had sexual relations with 57 people outside marriage, and he was married seven times. For reference, lesser Kians died in the Iliad. The vast majority of these encounters happened in the human way, good old intercourse. This, of course, means that the gods have functional genitalia in the same way humans do, and given their ability to impregnate this way, the same um, bodily fluids. The sheer volume of sexual interactions a god had also indicates they were characterised as having a significant amount of human lust, and given his adulterous nature, Zeus is evidence they had flawed morals based on these emotions. Another emotion they clearly displayed was fear, along with the very humane hunger for power. This can be seen when Zeus discovers his wife Metis is prophesied to bore a child that will overthrow him. He straight up eats her to stop it happening. Speaking of Metis, when Zeus chowed down on her, she happened to be pregnant with his daughter Athene, unbeknownst to him. In a very divine turn of events, little baby Athene kept cooking in Zeus, eventually being born fully formed and fully armoured from his brain. This, I'm sure you would agree, is absolutely not anthropomorphism. This sort of instance definitely draws attention to the fact man and God are very much different things. Gods are capable of a lot more stuff, especially in the world of procreation. Take Chaos, for example, one of the first and primordial gods. According to Hesiod's Theogony, they asexually produced, creating the gods Nyx, Night, and Erebus, Darkness. The process is called parthenogenesis, and it most certainly is not seen in humans. Daughter of Chaos, Nyx, also went on to asexually reproduce three children, Thanatos, Death, Eris, Discord, and Nemesis, Retribution. These primordial gods such as Nyx and Chaos are anthropomorphised a lot less than Olympians like Zeus. Potentially, this is due to them representing concepts that are a lot more abstract and much bigger. For example, the primordial goddess Gaia was thought to be the Earth and fully embody it. This is in contrast to the Olympians and gods of later generation who seem to be responsible for the elements like inanimate objects. Take Helios, for example. He is not the sun itself. Rather, he pulls the sun across the sky in a chariot each day and is therefore easier to imagine in a human form. Chaos is considered a genderless entity at the beginning of time. 
similar to Tartarus, being considered a dungeon of torment deep in the underworld, as well as being a primordial god that was born. This is not an exclusive rule, however. When the primordial god Uranus, the embodiment of the sky, was overthrown, he was described as being castrated by his son Cronus, indicating he had human genitals to be severed. Interpretations of this event, from the ancient world all the way to the 1455 painting The Mutilation of Uranus by Saturn, Cronus, by Giorgio Vasari and Gerardi Cristofano, all conclude that the gods were in a human form at the time. The Olympian gods also are not exclusively anthropomorphic. Zeus, when having intercourse with Danae, was described as a golden shower. Literally. The anthropomorphic form is also not considered to be the true form of the gods. Their true form described as so brilliant the human eye and mind cannot sustain or process seeing it. This is evidence when Zeus shows his true form to the mortal Semele after his jealous wife Hera tricks her into insisting. And she bursts into flames. The reason the Olympians and those on their line as a family tree, since they are descended from the primordial gods, may be more human is for relatability. It's a human fact that you'll be more likely to relate to somebody that is similar to you. And that's what the Greeks did. As Emma Aston said, anthropomorphizing the gods that the Greeks imagine are in control of their day-to-day lives makes encounters with them seem more likely and imaginable. This is very significant to the Greeks as when reading epics like the Odyssey that contain so much divine intervention, they would hope to see a god themselves in person. So, to finish, the primordial gods are barely anthropomorphic at all, their depiction almost exclusively abstract. The Olympian gods are mostly anthropomorphic, but at times match this abstract, as is seen in the Golden Shower story and is portrayed in some art. Anachronic images of the gods can be seen mostly in the Archaic period, as is evidenced in the representation of Aphrodite in the sanctuary of Aphrodite Paphia.